we were you know doing everything in person pre-pandemic but silver lining there's a certain other kind of intimacy that has happened with these zoom readings and being able to connect poets um, that wouldn't other otherwise be able to actually come to my little used bookstore. So I really um, I have uh, been very excited by being able to do these, these readings. So, uh, like I said, I'm very excited to have these poets here tonight. Just a little brief background. I met David last summer when he was a fellow at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. Um, he was a fellow for poetry, and I was asked to sit in on um, the culmination of his um, research and writing time that he had here in Worcester. And he also came into my bookstore and spent some time there sitting and writing. And it was an incredibly moving experience, and I think you'll see what I mean when um, we get going with the reading here. Um, he was doing a whole project of which he's going to be reading tonight on uh, the history of slavery in Massachusetts. And, you know, who could have known last year when I met him what the events of this past summer would be like and how this all launched into national consciousness in a renewed way. Um, but it's really important work that he was doing, and I was really honored to be able to sit in on his reading. And I even said, you know, I have an MFA in poetry. I said, that meeting <laughs> where he read with all the other fellows was like better than any MFA seminar that I sat in on. It was such incredible feedback and support in that room from all the other, other fellows. So I'm really excited to hear his work tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to read their bios. And what you're going to see then is David and Tim going back and forth uh, in 15-minute intervals or so reading. And then we're going to have a short conversation period at the end um, you know, where you can ask them questions, engage them in conversation. I like to encourage uh, conversation with these. So. David Mills. David Mills is the author of After Mystic, Massachusetts Slavery Poems, The Sudden Country, and The Dream Detective. He has received fellowships from the American Antiquarian Society, Breadloaf, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the Lannan Foundation. His poems have appeared in Plowshares, Colorado Review, Crab Orchard Review, Jubilat, and Fence. The Juilliard School commissioned and produced a play by Mr. Mills. He has also recorded his poetry on RCA Records and ESPN, and he lived in Langston Hughes, landmark Harlem home, which is so cool. I love that. Author of several poetry collections, including Hurdy Gurdy, Hammerlock, Buffalo Head Solos, and Fast Animal, which was a finalist for the 2012 National Book Award and winner of the Theodore Rutke Memorial Poetry Prize. Tim is also a former NEA fellow and a recipient of a fellowship from the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. His latest collection, One Turn Around the Sun, was released in 2017 and he recently completed a two-year appointment as Poet Laureate of Virginia. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to you too, and I'm very honored to have you reading tonight. All right. Good to be here. It's really nice to be here. Um, I guess I'll begin, and uh, I'll, I'll read from, the, from a One Turn Around the Sun, the more recent book, and then perhaps in the second, part of my reading, I'll read from Fast Animal. Those are, since those are the two most recent books. This is a poem called Ode to Your Mother. It 
it was just rooted in um, my mother occasionally would talk about, you know, the times that she was pregnant with me and I realized one doesn't think about that very much about where we spent the first part of our, our lives on earth. So I wrote this poem um, uh, for her, of course, but for all mothers, I suppose. Ode to your mother. Do you remember yourself six months after conception? Far from the egg, your heart chirping like a hungry chick. Those unwalked feet, fat crickets kicking around, eyes blind as buttons, cell by cell, rod by cone, getting ready to call up the colors and lights. And your mother, often craving licorice with apple pie, outside catching a bus with you in her warm pond, a golden koi nosing the surface for bits of bread, you, the unnamed stranger, coming for the long stay, traveling all night, your face taking shape in the shadows. Or maybe she sees herself, a bass drum with something booming inside her, a small theater off Broadway with someone soon to be famous pacing the wings. So much promise. Were you restless to begin? All your vitals rehearsing their hard parts. Did you have any sense that she was out there? Your brain almost building itself. A secret mansion, a million doors to a million rooms each with a candle, your little head holding the Milky Way rekindled in miniature. Consciousness, the great mischief, waking up to try again. One particular flicker in the cosmic sea, a starfish riding the big back of a blue whale, which swims like a planet, gliding the sun's slow waves with you beginning to insist inside this woman you hardly know, though she is everything, steadying her new weight on earth, your heart blind as a kite, wind on the rise three months from day. Did you suppose an inkling of what would be out there? The invisible air filling us up, rabbits in hats, hints, houses, banana slugs, bacteria, and trees. Other people, the look on your face, already amazed, or whatever comes just before that. Uh, this is OG your father. So Sunday nights, he put on Yusef Latif, and that flute stole secrets usually locked in the moon's cool house. And you watched his head nod yes to all he couldn't say. Then tiptoed back to TV, hoping he'd forget it was past your time for bed. When he yelled at you, you probably heard his father yelling at him, though you couldn't recognize the flat don't talk back settled beneath his voice like a big bass at the bottom of a lake. Growing up, he said, yes, sir, to that brassy baritone. And wasn't his father's father's voice a part of him too, that part that seemed tied up in some long ago trouble, even when he sat in the shade, baiting a hook. Hard to picture him now in his straw hat and high water dungarees, Oklahoma boy moping home with a loaf of bread, 
his buddies teasing and tempting him back to the park. How did he face his first bully, the one that cracked his tooth and cut his arm? Ever wonder where he got that hot grease in the face glare, the look that made you so afraid? His father made him fight that tough kid twice. And at times, didn't the whole country try to break his skin, waiting for him on every corner like a bully? What did he make of all those stores that wouldn't let him in? He worked the slaughterhouse, stiff with dry blood. His overalls could stand by themselves. In spite of this, you found him years later, your pop mopping the kitchen, whistling My Satin Doll, a tune you hadn't heard, so half listened as if he was some odd station on the radio. And when he'd start the old, things were different back then. It sounded like once upon a time. You shrugged and secretly rolled your eyes, but half of you is still made of him. His long arms, his love of hats, your solitary heart, half jazz, half ready to fight. Your father didn't kiss you like your mother did, but every October he drove you to the arboretum to see the blood orange leaves, even when he had a lot on his mind. That mind you'll never see inside, though you know it's packed with good songs, some hard feelings, and all the stuff he will not say. This poem is called Composite. Your weight on one foot, then the other walking. That taste of baked bread so bright, your mouth is born again. December, a coin, cold circle in your hand, each of us made from two people, your body an angel's tambourine, the self something like lamplight on a slush covered street. Can someone else see what I mean? Does everybody hear that slight ringing? And I'll close my section with this poem. It's a villanelle, um, it's the 3030 Blues Villanelle. Who can tell a man not to go where he goes? I laid the long tracks, my life waves from the train. I was 30 almost 30 years ago. Being grown up means you're supposed to know, although I don't know what I can explain. And I was 30, like 30 years ago. I bend with the music breaking hard, but slow. Jobs kidnap the daylight, then leave the remains. Just kiss me goodbye when it's time to go. It looks like we're losing, but say it ain't so. Dumb news and new killers get most of the fame. Why tell a man not to run when he goes? My dad's on a walker, his whole life in tow. If you'd seen him at 40, you'd say, what a shame. But he was 40, almost 50 years ago. Sanity pretends to pretend that you know. You've seen some good friends go off in the brain. Luck's hand was better than their hands could show.
Why needle a riddle when the answer is no? Been poking the troubles, but the trouble remains. And I've been 30 since 30 years ago. I look at young men and think, where did I go? Play some guitar while death tunes my name. Guess this is the what I should already know. Because I was 30, 30 years ago. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, hear me, see me? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tim, for that. Uh, and you know that last poem. Obviously, I've been with you with that, so that just hits me. Uh, so all these poems are about slavery in Massachusetts. I want to thank the American Antiquarian Society for the research time and the writing time. I want to thank Nicole for making this possible. And her shop is not a small place; it's a very lovely place. It feels like you're in someone's elegant living room with just tons of books in there, and you can get food too. So please go buy when things open back up. This first piece. Uh, Amiri Baraka has a poem called In the Tradition. So this first piece is for Phyllis Wheatley, who was the first African-American to publish a full-length book of poems and maybe the first African-American to publish a full-length book. 1773, it's called Poems on Subjects, Religious and Moral. My piece is called An Almost Audience. Um, uh, I refer to her, uh, or I should say, a prepubescent uh, enslaved individual who was a woman was considered the least valued of black bodies. So I'm vibing on that. The prose poem is almost like a gloss of her life through the poem. I actually went to uh, Ile de Gore, which is likely, this is an island off of Senegal, which is likely where she had been abducted from. So I actually was in the slave dungeon she might have been in on her way here. And she was named after the ship that brought her here, uh, the Phyllis. She, she almost met with King George III in the Old South Meeting House is a religious house in Boston, an almost audience for Phyllis Wheatley. Of Senegambia and Seven, she should have been of the not to be taken, the not high price for not prime boys, a girl of the unsuitable labor, birth, not work, and that years away. The captured, their spirits, ships sinking inside them, but there could have been a rising up, so she was of the constant watch, the on your guard, the danced on deck, the merchant Quinn and Captain Fitch, the sterling purchase. Haunches, flanks, slicked and oiled before the shore, sold and resold in Boston Harbor, profit, barter, and harvest, barter, harvest, and profit, trinket, slaves, and salt cod, salt cod, trinkets, and slaves, bought, then brought on the middle passage, but would one day read passages of her work in London, neither stowage, cash crop, nor export, bidden thought, garnering an almost audience with George III, an actual one with Washington. For on a ship, your prayer is to reach as well as return. She who'd been named for the schooner that brought her to Boston, three months crumpled in the hull, like being trapped in a capsized macaw's wretched beak, the gulf weed, the squawk, the whistle, the mimic of the ocean's moods or inhuman moans, that unequilateral tragic triangle. She remembered parrots in Savannah oil palms, charcoal heads, constant chatter, pearl millet gleaming in their beaks. Boston worthies called her parrot, inky mimic. But little of that life in her tutored lines, merchant, servant, sickly infants, more words but no means to publish them. A cooped husband, free black grocer who'd set penury on a feeble table. Poems on subjects religious and moral. Hell is an elegy one never finishes. In her eyes, leaking northern light, she might have recalled Horace, Clenchon, Homer, and Greek, fame's listing shimmer, homilies on Washington and milk at the Old South Meeting House. Although emancipated, she might have thought of escape to join the angelic train, embarking on the ship, listing slipshod and backwards through her name, Phyllis. And I say that last part, if you look through her name and look through it going backwards, the word ship is within it. And I think that's just a really beautiful thing, not my discovery, but the fact that that word is within her name. The next piece is called Water and Time, since Tim did a villanelle. This is a sestina. So it's a seven stanza poem. Uh, the first six stanzas are six lines each. And the last word of each line is repeated in the ensuing five stanzas, but in different orders. And this is a meditation on intersectionality. 
Um, obviously, we're having all these discussions about what's going on currently, but their oppression that manifests in many ways. And so you had my enslaved ancestors in the South picking cotton. And in 1836, $600 million of the US like GDP was directly or indirectly from slave labor. And that was half of the US economy. So when we talk about things like reparations, you know, think on that. Half of the US economy came out of cotton. Who was picking that? On the other side, in Massachusetts, and this is why this poem, there were white women who were working in these mills. They were being exploited in various ways, uh, sick, uh, working 72 hour weeks. So this is a, a sestina, and I mean, the form is weaving, but I'm weaving these two sort of exploitations, if you would, one paid, one unpaid, but all servicing the engine of capitalism. This is called Water and Time. And there's a lot of diction from, uh, 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 you know, mills and factories and then from cotton fields. So you're going to hear things like flying shuttles, spinning jinnies, scutchers, spindles. If you need me to define afterwards, I will. Water and Time, Meditation on Massachusetts Cotton Mills and Southern Cotton Plantations. The mule and harrow that shadows her in the cotton, due north a water wheel is tickled by the Charles River. North or south, work is a disciple of time. For the soil, for the factories, the necessary daughter is water. Bowls of soil, bowls of bricks, ingredients that feed a town. A factory is just a brick field. Taller than most men, branches lap each other in the field, where slaves put together that deranged bouquet, cotton, to be nurtured by spinners and weavers in a distant northern town. Again and again they hoe, again and again for a distant river, what do field slaves know of linens and woolens, their northern wedding to water? Mules are curried, seeds are dropped in the rusted bucket of time. The driver is shadow, saddle, whip, and time. Can't see to can't see with 10 minutes for cold bacon in the field. It flows to and follows money's many orders. That's water. So the yarn and twist is fashioned from raw, long staple cotton. Flying shuttles and spinning jinnies weave memories like a river. A stick is a pillow in a skinny town. Warp and weft, the one currency in this mill town. The thump of spindle and loom is how they tell time. The scutcher and twist longs to mimic the river. Dawn socked by a horn, a human hurry tackles the field. The backbreaking bent over the homilies for cotton. Bowls unlocked as if untying a knot of white water. Winter boilers warm the mills, hours slow as caught water. The smokehouse and corn crib pours water of a slave mouse town. Pack saddle caterpillar, the devil's echo in the cotton. Mill girls found power 73 hours a week, the lie of time. Four brick stories, 250 spindles make up a concrete field, the up and back or either side of a picking river. The dry cotton burrs stick like stubborn rivers. The weevil aims for the bowl, the throat hopes for water. Saw briars nick the aches and legs working in the fields. Long staple is a horror story, a yarn that twists an indifferent town. Thump balloon 200 times. Multiply that by, multiply that pi. Fret not, it's the shiver of time when a nation ties endless economic knots with cotton. A damask gown is a river of processed cotton. Here water is but a slave and mill girl's tears and time. What does a Fifth Avenue mansion know of fields and flywheels? Oppressions meek weave in a snot cocky town. And that the envoy, the last three lines are connecting it with imagining like a Fifth Avenue, like the Vanderbilt houses and someone's wearing a damask gown, which would have been made out of cotton. So their lack of understanding of the cotton picked in the South, the mill girls and connecting that to capitalism. Uh, the last piece in this section um, is called the Cooper of Sandwich. Um, and this very much makes this link across time. Uh, it's after a gentleman named Samuel Smith, an English colonist who lived in Sandwich, Massachusetts, who in July 1719 beat his Negro servant Fortune to death, but was not convicted for this and claimed Fortune choked on his own tongue in anger. So it kind of has that sense of like accountability and the lack of it with the black body, even to the present day with state sanctioned violence. The Cooper of Sandwich. With as many children as months in a calendar, as many children as eggs in a carton, Mr. Smith 
the cooper of sandwich excited suspicion, excited inquiry, excited the public, which led to the arrest of this master from sandwich for the murder of his Negro servant. A leather horsewhip valued at two pence in his right hand, but during strike after strike of his Negro's racked frame, during those bruisings and stripes, was Smith in his right mind? How do the chasms in Christendom, the gulfs of contempt, answer for this offense? When a man dies within an hour of a whip catching its leather breath, how do you acquit the cooper of sandwich? His fine a pittance, one shilling, six pence. In a coming country of malice and forethought, in a county of sandwich, murder is a distinct form of servitude. There is God, there is a coming country, there is the cooper who is merely defending himself against the inches of Negro air encroaching upon him. He acknowledged the flogging, but swore the Negro committed suicide. He acknowledged the flogging, but the eclipse of the causing was suffocation. Died of the slave, his ungovernable temper, where hence is acquitted and the Negro's tongue is punished, accused of killing itself by backing into its own voice box. These the words of two esquires. An indictment is an only under such circumstance. A conviction is an unheard of, and a master had never dangled for somehow gleefully snapping every bone of a Negro's New England breath. So I turn it back to you, Mr. Tim. All right, David, hey man, that was, uh, well, I know it was poems, so I know they're amazing, but I appreciate the history lesson, brother, I really do. Um, I'm going to start with a poem. I've been working on a series of poems um, in which the poem itself is a character in the poem. And uh, I'll just read this. I wanted to read this because I'm, I wanted to riff off what you were just doing. Um, and this is, uh, it begins, the title is Sometimes at the Airport, and it's dedicated to the Cave Canem family. Um, the title goes right into the poem, so I'll, I'll just begin that way. Sometimes at the airport, the poem wishes a few more black poems were traveling. Not that the poem doesn't feel a part of the entire poem family. Not that its <laughs> frequent flyer miles don't add up like anyone's. It's just that the poem has trouble shedding a certain sense of isolation and worries that its concerns are often pretty narrowly prescribed by others who believe they know a black poem when they see one. It's April and poems all over the nation are a little more glad. The weather balmy with a sort of burly wind that bends the newly green branches every leaf a child's hand waving as if a giant Snoopy were floating by in a parade. Not every black poem is about race, the poem says. I want to talk about everything, everything from a black perspective, the scholars grin, a studied sense of diversity and urban pathology pursing their small lips. Beneath this face could be a poem like any poem, the poem insists, trying to be concise and undeterred. But most people are already counting the months until February. That jazzy and brief memorial to centuries of chronic struggle when they can really listen. All right, now I'll read a few poems from, from Fast Animal. I'll read this poem. Um, this, is, uh, this is Notes from Big Bra Tom the Bomb. That's my brother, his name Tom. And this poem is in two voices, and it's built out of things he actually said to me over the years when I was growing up. Um, so it's notes from Big Bra Tom the Bomb, Don Juan of Germantown High School, 1967-1968. You 
you'll be able to tell who's Tom and who, who I am in this poem. I say, Tom, there's this girl. He says, is she fine like apple wine? She fine enough to be a friend of mine. Her name is Tina. So you want to give Tina your wiener? And Doc's having a party. Is she tuned to your station? She believe in what you faking? And she's going to be there. Tell her you know the way to San Jose. Tell her you got to graze in her grass. Tell her you ain't too proud to beg. Yeah, you gots to rock Hudson on her. Give her the movie star moon gazer. The look of love say, my duty is your booty. Tell her your Peter is sweeter and you know how to treat her. You got to sing a little bit, a little brother. Gots to hit her with a little bit of Sinatra. Everybody loves my body sometimes. <laughs> anyway, that's my big brother. All right. Um, this is a poem. Uh, let me see. I'll read this poem since we're just beginning the football season. I'll read this one. It's called Terry Moore, who was a buddy of mine uh, growing up. We're still friends. Uh, we met when we were 12. We're still friends, goodness gracious, 50, 53 years later. All right. I think the poem will more or less explain itself. There's a couple of slangs in here, but I think it'll come clear what we're talking about. Terry Moore. Our moms got us together at Woolworths. Remember? Cheeseburgers, summertime 1967. 12 years in the world, mostly we burned for football to get it and move, to shake anybody that wanted to bring us down. Six points was all we needed and time to find the future where we'd be badass superstars. We thought it was hard being young with adults running things and it got harder not to think about girls and which words would bring them close to our hands. Mini skirts. Remember checking the cheese in study hall? Marna Evans. We had no idea where those legs could lead. If it weren't for movies and the legends of our big brothers, we might never have believed in smooth whispers, long kisses, and maybe even now, we'd be dreaming only football. The rough touch of leather, tightly laced, grabbed and carried to a place where men danced with nothing to explain. The end zone, the promised land. And who could blame us for craving such a simple destination? Then came Joni. And for me, it was Jane, short hugs, slow songs, their mouths swimming into our mouths. Among the Philly brothers, the word was swag. Did you swag on her? We'd ask, supposing the wet dream of lips. How many times did y'all swag? So new, the French kiss, the perfect neighborhood for anyone as crazy and blue balled as boys blazing on the verge of the verge of their lives. Man, we spent years on the phone daring each other not to be young, not to be afraid of whatever sex might mean. That paperback you found, Nurse Nadine, the way she treated her patients, what exactly was a blowjob? And how long would it be till we knew? Our fathers were scary men younger than we are now and ready to make themselves clear without saying anything, especially when we got too cool to listen, too big to hear. Did they believe in sex the way we were starting to? Was there some secret living softly inside their fists? My father loved my mother. It looked so simple. Year after year, the kiss goodbye after breakfast, the kiss hello about five, conversation at dinner, TV until time for bed. It's pretty clear I didn't know much about my parents, just that they were usually 
nice people, and mostly on my side. And this makes me wonder just how blind I'm gonna be, because these days I hardly see anything the way I saw things back then. And bruh, my eyes are wide open. The NFL will never see us. I can't do half the moves we used to do. Loose leg lean, that cut back stutter, short grass lit beneath our simmering feet. But I'm glad these 40 years have found us still friends, that we played some football, watched each other break slowly into men, which is what we are by now, which was always what we thought we really wanted. And I'll close my section with this piece. I can find it, I'm sorry. This is a poem called, this is a poem called Blade Unsympathetic. Uh, this is a poem in the voice of Blade, the vampire slayer. Um, uh, it has an epigraph, they don't matter, they're our food. That's Deacon Frost, one of the leading vampires. Of course, I mean, of course, this is metaphor, right? <laughs> Blade, unsympathetic. Ever take communion? Ever watch the war on TV? This place is for predators, baby. It doesn't matter that you never knew. Your innocence is the key they turn to let you out and lock you in. Nobody wants to see what's really happening. And by the time you start to understand, the baby teeth are gone and the big teeth come in. You're in the blood and the blood's on you. If you play along, almost everyone will sort of be your friend. In the human world, don't the wolves look a lot like the sheep before the slaughter begins? Try to remember, is that your face in the window? Is that your name on the card? Maybe you should get some body armor. What else can I say? Mine is black. Eat as much garlic as you can. Thank you. Turn it back to David. Thank you, Tim. Um, happy Rosh Hashanah. I forgot to say that earlier, but uh, I don't know if any of you uh, noticed. Someone sent me something. Ruth Bader Ginsburg just died. Sorry to bring that news. Did you all hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. I hear you, David. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, you and me both in more ways than one. Um, so we'll dedicate the rest of this to RBG. Um, this is called Hear Her Before. Um, Massachusetts, uh, the first three enslaved uh, Negroes to get there. Uh, freedom through legal means. We're in Massachusetts, and one of them is the individual I'm going to read about, uh, Belinda Sutton, who had been owned by uh, a man named Isaac Royal Jr., and part of the import of him, besides having owned her, was that he, in his will, left money for a uh, law professorship at Harvard and basically endowed Harvard Law School, and his monies were made from sugar plantations or slave labor camps, as I like to call them, in Antigua. So Harvard Law Schools start has blood on its hands. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, she was likely abducted from Ghana, the upper Volta region. Uh, Ghana had the most slave dungeons during the transatlantic slaves trade, which is 47. Obroni is a West African term for whites. Agya is, means father and Meme means mother in Twi, which is uh, one of the languages in Ghana, one of the ethnic groups. Ogun is an Orisha, and they're the equivalent of a Catholic saint, um, uh, Europeans, and when encountering uh, many uh, West Africans thought that they were practicing animism. There actually is 
a monotheistic religion in their religion, Ifa, and the high god is named Oludmar, who I refer to here as well. Ashe means power. So this is uh, about and in the voice of Linda Royal, it's two parts. For Belinda Royal Sutton, who petitioned the Massachusetts General Court in 1783, recounting her life story and claiming a pension from the estate of Isaac Royal Jr., who for 50 years she had served. To hope a mouth can be divided between two houses, a lip for the Senate, perhaps a tongue for the representatives. To hope to honor the assembled with an African's petition. Humbly Belinda, though not her words, it was her life. Three score and ten years removed from the Volta River, the Whitewood Mountains, the Valley's butternut squash. Nightmares can be an evening's omens, but no amount of imagining, not even the brain's wildest fragrances, could have prepared her for Obroni. Her toddler's arch unthinking as it gathered and released dust, as one hand cupped in her agyas and one cupped in her maymays, she praised Ogun leaving alligator pepper and yam in a sacred grove, Ashe. But as she held her unblemished hands high, Obroni snatched her. She cried out to Oludemar, but was rent from parents deemed too old for the ocean's crossing, watched by men whose faces were white as plates, she would one day be made to clean. Two. My hands were forced to give 50 years to Isaac Royal, I've heard his breath recently snap from his body past half the Atlantic I was forced to cross in a bobbing wasp's nest. Only death could free me from this man whose walls boiled with splendor, house servants trumping his doors with their comings and goings. He opened those same Georgian doors one last time as the cries of liberty encouraged him to England. Freedom was an experience knotted up and only known in the space between my ears. Now hunched, my body is a gray rainbow. Worthy men, at your feet, I cast nothing but bone and virtue, asking for an allowance from Royal's estate, 15 pounds and 12 shillings, a pension for my sickly daughter and me. Think on this, prayer is two hands holding nothing. Excuse me. Prayer is two hands holding nothing, waiting for something to come out of it. I beg something for the breast remaining for us both. This February, this Boston, this Valentine's, 1783. X, here is my mark. You've heard my before. Permit me this after. I didn't mean for that to happen. Maybe Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Belinda Royal Sutton's realities are visiting. Uh, this next piece is a, a bit experimental. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm not real good with technology and there was a poster. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, there was a poster at the Antiquarian Society uh, of a gentleman named Anthony Burns who had escaped and um, he was captured and it was during the time of the fugitive slave laws. I was hoping to be able to put this as my background, but I wasn't able to. Uh, I hope you can see what I'm holding with my phone. This is a, a photo of the poster. And what I'm doing is, um, uh, it's an ecrastic poem. So it's like a poem that's responding to art. And it's, I'm saying the lines that you see there, I'm not gonna keep holding it. And then I'm commenting on the font size and the type and sort of imagining how loud or how soft the different sizes of type are. And this is from like 18. We can't, we can't see it, David. Maybe you can hold a little. Is that any better? No, hold it a little, hold it by your face. Oh, by my face. There we go. That's a okay. little better. Yeah. Can, can you sort of see what I'm getting at? So this yeah. is this poster. And I'm reading an ecrastic poem and it's just commenting on the, oh boy, the lettering, but also commenting on slavery, escape, you know, the determined nature of this man, because then he was sold back to uh, Virginia or taken back and then he escaped again and lived the rest of his life 
albeit short, in Boston. So this is called uh, Black Caps and very much experimental. So just bear with me and then I'll finish with a narrative piece. Black Caps. After a poster advertising formerly enslaved Anthony Burns' speech in Ashburnham, so he was giving a speech, my apologies, in 1853, Burns escaped slavery in Virginia, fled to Boston, was captured, returned south, and eventually had his freedom purchased, and he subsequently returned to Boston. So I'm going to just like say a line, like one of the things you saw, and then I'm sort of commenting on how it looks and the font size and the type, and then some poetic stuff. Okay, Anthony, all caps, heart black, white star, sable shadow, Three quarter inches, a 20 line pica, center justified printed shout, condensed gothic shade, throw some. Burns, all black, all caps, 20 line pica Roman, three and three sixteenth inches of center justified printed squawk. Will give a narrative of his first escape from all black, some caps, two line pica Roman, quarter inch of center justified printed hush. Slavery, all caps, all black. 10 line pica antique one and a half inch center justified printed yawp. His arrest in Boston, his return to the South and his treatment previous to his final purchase on all black, some caps, two line pica Roman quarter inch center justified printed innuendo. Friday evening, April 13th, all black, all caps, seven line extra condensed one and an eighth of an inch of center justified printed yammer at the all black, all caps, two line pica Roman quarter inch center justified printed belts. Town hall, all black, all caps, eight line pica Roman one and a quarter inch center justified printed shriek. Excuse me. In Ashburnham, ornamented six line pica Roman seven eighths of an inch of center center justified printed whimsy, comma dash dash comma comma. Three lines, thus rice thick middle thin in thin bookends. Doors open at 6.30, lecture commences at 7.30. All black, paltry caps, six line pica antique, extra condensed, three quarters of an inch of center justified printed equanimity, period. Three lines, diddy ditto, the thrice, thicker middle, thin bookends. Mr. Burns will devote the proceeds of his lecture for the purpose of all, double small pica Roman, all caps, all black, quarter inch center justified scrunch print, educating himself for the ministry, all black, dispense cap, six line pica antique, condensed center justified printed whoop, just an inch, period. Two lines thick, top thin, bottom twice. Tickets, 12 and a half cents. All caps, all blacks, end stop, 5.5 line pica Roman, three quarters of an inch of printed distillation. W. Fuller, three line gothic condensed, all caps, all black, half an inch, rigid print, right justified, yet inequity is not, period, 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 point blank. So this last piece, uh, uh, boy, I gotta look at my notes. Where, where, where? Okay. Um, this is called uh, "Unhired Hand," and this is another gentleman who uh, gained his freedom through the courts. Uh, his name was uh, Quack Walker. Quack is a uh, uh, a day name from Ghana, um, so he was able to keep his uh, African name. Uh, he was actually enslaved to one gentleman who died. And that gentleman's widow married another guy who tried to purchase Quack, and Quack sort of resisted this. Uh, trying to see if there's any, you know, well, let me just read it, and then if there's anything. Uh, and he was enslaved in Worcester. So, you know, there was another piece I read. So you all, most of you are based in Worcester, or certainly the bookstore is. So I find it kind of amazing that I was able to actually get historical stuff rooted in Worcester, and that's where the fellowship was. So, um he, he had three trials and eventually got his freedom from Nathaniel Jennison in 1781. And this is all um, similarly with Belinda Royal, these dates around these enslaved Africans getting their freedom. It's relevant because the Massachusetts Constitution was ratified in 1781. So they were very much saying, look, you say, you know, all men, and that was the word they use, are created equal. So we're, you know, putting your, your words in your face right now. If we're all men, if we're all humans, we deserve this equality and freedom as well. This is called an unhired hand in the voice of Quack Walker. I offer you my unhired hand and let me do the whatever work, wearing clothes outfitted in failure, outfitted in questions of was I servant or was I slave? The Caldwells, the brothers of my older former who mastered them, my mother, father, had me working land fertilized by a cemetery of fish. 
Let me work with corn and squash and hens of guinea. Fence me in invisibly. Yeoman Nathaniel Jennison married my older former's widow and took me to court, believing he owned me, believing he could administer a proper disciplinary beating. How could I desert a master, for I would also have to desert the servant I never was? What of Exodus? Any slave who has been purchased may eat of it after circumcision. The Passover, the wandering in a clinched wilderness, eat of it. Then let the earth issue a verdict about Jenison trying to reclaim my spit and ankles, trying to drag me back to those sour hours, trying to lock me in an outbuilding. Encouraged by the brother blood of my former master, I drag Jenison before a judge. The law is a black letter. I beg your leave. I am not services to be reclaimed, a bill of sale for probate, a fetter. I am not Jenison's few friends circling me with Medford rum circling their tongues. I am not a case that rests because my mistress now also rests in peace. I am neither implied nor expressed a Christian trip and fall. I am indisputable, a, con a contract's absence, a holy writ. Or yes, I may be the Caldwell's plan, the crack of abolition's ham-handed gavel as I stand in Worcester's court of common pleas and ask for 300 pounds in damages already done. There's a constitution plump in my skull because I am just beyond the jurisdiction of flinch. I am not theory and practice, but flesh is plaintiff. Breast's 18th century evidence, Jenison's point unproven, justice's hiccup, a pinch of abolition, a legal sprinkle under intense scrutiny, a verdict, and the way it slowly returns. For Ruth Bader Ginsburg, rest in power and for my ancestors. Oh my goodness, I don't even know how to speak after this. <laughs> oh. Just want to say thank you all. I can't see folks, but thank you all for being there. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Tim. You're beyond the blessing, my friend. Thank you to both of you. An incredibly powerful moving reading. Uh, and you both were such a wonderful balance to each other and the sensibilities that you brought to it. Um, would I would like to just take a few minutes. I, I know it's it's eight o'clock, and if anybody has to go, um, feel free. But I just want to take a few minutes to um, honor what just happened here, <laughs> and to open it up to anybody that has any questions, or for either Tim or David, or any just comments on the work itself. I mean, I've been watching the chat. And I've been watching, uh, I, I don't know if Tim and David, if you, either of you have been watching the chats, but it's just, it's been praise after praise after praise. So, um, so if anyone would like to put a question into the chat. Um, I don't have a question, but I just want to say thank you to both of you gentlemen. For thank you, Francis. Well, thank, really thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We appreciate your your time and your energy. You could be many places. And and I appreciate that the bookstore and the WCPA are making these readings available to us um, because I'm in Brooklyn now. I don't oh. live here anymore. So it's just fabulous to be able to participate in the readings that are coming to the region. Hi, um, I'm Joan Digby. And I'm actually the publisher of David's book, After Mystic. And David, when you read the poem with all of the um, type, <laughs> type designations, I often wondered how that would be as a reading, but it was fabulous. Thank and you. I do want to say, I think that your poetry and Tim's poetry really balanced perfectly in this reading. And I'm hoping that uh, maybe the whole thing would be available on YouTube for other people to hear. I did not have any visuals at all. 
So I was just listening to words and I felt very moved by what both of you had to say and the way that you both read and balanced each other. I'm just so happy that I was able to join tonight. Thank you both. And thanks, thanks for hosting this. It was just spectacular. Oh, Thank you, Joe. Wonderful. I just would like to say this this has been recorded and it Great. will be available on the WCPA's YouTube channel. So the Worcester County Poetry Association has a YouTube channel and it'll take a little bit before it's up there, but it, it will it will go up there as long as David and Tim you're both okay with it. We can of course. We can yeah, yeah, yeah. talk offline about that. Yeah, we don't we don't write them to hide them. So <laughs> well said, well said, yeah. well said. If David had been an 18th century poet, which is actually my field, he would have been called the scholar poet in that time. And I just love David the way you integrated all of your notes with the reading. It was wonderful, and uh, mm. Tim's counterpoint was fabulous. So thank, thank you. you both so much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. I thought it would work. I thought it would work well together. <laughs> yeah. If I could just chime in real quickly, um, my name is Jesse Washington. I'm a college classmate of David's. I'm doing. Yeah. Yo. What up, Dave? How you um, doing, man? Just really appreciate Bedlam Books for organizing this and the other organizers. And I'm excited to uh, learn of the work of Mr. Tim Siebels. Um, and so just thank you for this event this evening. I deeply appreciate it. Very much appreciated you there. Yeah, man, very glad much. for your time and your ears. There was some powerful community building that happened on this reading tonight. And that's one of, that's been one of the unexpected things of these Zoom readings. Cause I was very anti, when the pandemic first happened, I was like, no, we can't do poetry readings on Zoom. Mm. Yeah, well, it's not so bad. Yeah, they, they, some, sometimes they're just fine, you know. I mean, I don't think anything is as good as being in your bookstore with you, but yeah, <laughs> you know. I concur. I do have a, a question for you, David. I, I was wondering, um, you know, you have such a historical material that you're working with, um, but it almost seems like divination the way that it just comes through you like it's just it's like it wants to be told I almost think of like Alice Walker when she talked about how she wrote the color purple right, and right. how that book just came through her hmm. and it was like spoken to her hmm. um, and I wanted to ask you about your process and like how how that works for you how these what what catches your fancy about a particular story or whatever and the then the language that you get from it it's so meaty and just sonic yeah I, 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 like i wanted to say something earlier like Gwendolyn brooks gave me some license because the registers of diction of some of the folks is likely higher than they might have actually spoken with i mean i can't say for sure but she has an incredible persona poem called negro hero uh which is in the voice of dory miller who actually saved an innumerable number of white sailors uh, on the uss arizona uh when uh pearl harbor had happened and he was a, a mess person uh, meaning working in the kitchen he didn't have an eighth grade education grew up in rural texas but the register is really high and uh, meaning of the diction and I, it's I think she's trying to reach across the divide to a readership. So like with the voice of Quack Walker and Belinda, I, I feel like I'm taking some license with her register being high in the voice of uh, Dory Miller to also bring theirs up. I mean, I think Quack was a, for the time and for his station an educated person as well as Belinda, but I don't know if they might've said the law is a black letter, if you know what I'm saying. So there's that kind of playing, but then I'm also really using kind of syntax to kind of play with things and create music by destabilizing syntax, like kind of inverting things and putting a lot of clauses together that don't resolve, if you would. So trying to create some tension there. Um, and I, you know, that month I was there, as they would say in hip hop, I was digging in the crate. So I was reading 
all day and writing all day. So there's a channeling, but there was also very much that chiseling, you know, it wasn't, and no disrespect to Alice Walker because The Color Purple is a phenomenal text. Um, it, it, there, it, it was very deliberate working. There were things that came because I think if you're staying on the pulse of something, you are going to get gifts. And I will say, um, working on some poems about slavery in New York, and I remember saying to Tim, like I kind of finished the grant uh, stipulation and these ideas keep coming to me. And he said, hey man, just be quiet. It's the it's ancestors telling you to tell their story. So I do believe there is some of that there. And I like I think of with uh, Yeats and Shakespeare, I've often said it feels like they, it was like the echo of the universe was like working through their words. You know what I mean? Like it's beyond yeah. just, just kind of the conscious mind. Mm -hmm doing what it's doing on paper. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, you did. And yeah, the manipulation of the syntax and the just the semantics of it all, I think that's that's partly what makes me respond the way that I do because it's more than just telling that story. It's like you said, it's it's manipulating it and playing with it and pushing it. You really push it. You make it impossible to look away. And I think that's what's so powerful about it. It's not just the telling of the story. Thank you. I mean, that the, 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 the battle and what I try to say with historical work is that you have to make it sing because the historians yeah. have already written the history. So why are you writing these poems if they don't yeah. sing? Make it interesting. As Ezra Pound said, make it new. Yeah, right. Also, also um, a lot of that history seems to be absent from, at least from my education, I'll tell you. Oh, that. no, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. you, you're singing them because uh, I think otherwise they, they're just going to the abyss, you know? No, I, I totally agree. But I'm just saying like in that academic world, like folks might know about this or, right? Oh, right, so, right. so then okay. it becomes like, okay, so why are you writing these poems if you're just going to kind of make line breaks of like history? Mm. So it's that challenge of like, okay, how do I make this sing? And sometimes it's also about that persona yeah. going inside of their interior space and trying to write out of that, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Rather than just being outside of the history, going inside of Belinda, going inside of Quack and trying to imagine like Patricia Smith going into that interior space and writing out of some degree of sympathy with their psyches, trying to imagine what it was like for them and sing for them. Mm. Sing for them, yeah. <laughs> you know, David, else? Go oh, go ahead, David. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just, you know, selflessly plugging to on your behalf. I mean, oh, uh, Nicole, I, I'd, uh, I'd, <laughs> I'd like Nicole to remind does. everyone that your books are for sale. Right. Through. So she, you know, she has copies if you are interested, and whatever we can chit and chat. And there, there are other variations on the theme. I have an ekphrastic poem about Isaac Royal. There's a painting of him in the Harvard Law School in Langdale Hall. Uh, so I have a, a an ekphrastic sonnet meditating on that piece and whether or not the average person, no matter how learned they are, walking by that painting is aware that. One, he established Harvard Law School, but then also the monies that established it were from monies from enslaved labor on sugar plantations in Antigua. Uh, you know, whether that's going to say, oh, hey, should I not go or go? I still think that whole kind of contextualizing of history and, and antecedents is important. So, and I have a, a guzzle about William Lloyd Garrison. So, in the same way with that water and time piece, it's not this oh, you know, whatever, like white oppression, it, it, oh, this stuff is complex, very complex. So it's meditating on Garrison. And then also one of the psychic, to me, ironies about Massachusetts is on one level, you had the most strident abolitionist uh, impulses in that state. But then on the other side, the, mo the, 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 the most economically powerful cotton mills in the United States were in Massachusetts. <laughs> And you heard what I said about half of the U.S. economy in 1836 came out of slave labor cotton. So Massachusetts is very much implicated in the peculiar institution. And we don't like think about these connections. So it's almost this kind of multiple personality thing going on within the psyche of the state. So just trying to also explore all that tension in the poems, if you know what I mean. 
Yeah, uh, which is wonderful. I remember last summer when I first heard you read these poems and you were telling me about that contradiction, how Massachusetts was, you know, oh, abolitionist, yet they're profiting off of that slave labor. Right. And I'm saying in the most massive, well, this is not, and I don't mean any disrespect in, in what you're saying, but this is not even just profiting. This is, as I said, half of the U.S. economy right. in 1836 came from cotton and Massachusetts by far had the most cotton mills in the United States of America. Yeah. Dig on this. Dig on this. Yeah. So you have the abolitionist movement. We take nothing away from that. I mean, we even have, um, and, and Tim, we, you kind of um, mentioned uh, John Greenleaf Whittier. He was one of the few poets speaking out against slavery. He was from Massachusetts. So it's just interesting, these like tensions. And I don't, I don't see it as a contradictory. I see it as complexity. And like, hmm. how do we kind of live in the break? Uh, well you know said. what I mean? Well said. How do we live in the break? Yeah. Well, I could like listen to both of you. I wish this was just going to go on all night, <laughs> but I want to be sensitive to everyone's time, your time. And I really uh, thank you so much for, um, for participating in this, um, for telling people about it. Thank you so much to all the people that showed up. Um, it's this kind of stuff, honestly, these kinds of readings, I don't know about you guys, but they keep me going and I'm pretty self-interested, I guess, in having them because it's just medicine for my soul. So I, from watching the comments, I do think some of the rest of you are feeling that way. And, um, you know, I just thank you both so much for your time and, and for doing this. So. It was great. Thank you so much, so much, so much for having us. You know, it was great. I got to hear David read. I got to see David. Like, hey, everybody, because we're all at home because of COVID. So right. it's nice to see people, you know. And nice, nice. to put a face yeah. to your name, Nicole. I, I had ideas about you, but I didn't know you looked like you. All right. Bless you all. Have a good night, everyone. Yes. yes.